Professor Larry Humes from Indiana University. Uh, you are a scientific organizer of this conference, HEAL, uh, Hearing Across the Lifespan. Uh, which are the um, most important, important messages uh, uh, from this conference? Um, well, you know, this is the first conference where they put um, both ends of the age continuum together. So prior to this, there was a long standing conference on hearing in newborns, and then um, uh, 2010 was the first year that they also decided to have a separate conference on um, aging uh, or adults with hearing loss. And then this year is the first time they put both of them together to really cover the lifespan. And so I think one of the things um, that's common across the entire lifespan is trying to identify hearing loss and problems of hearing impaired people as soon as possible. And then once you identify them, it's important to have intervention as early as possible. And so I think those are two common themes that run across the entire lifespan, early detection of hearing loss and then early intervention once it's been detected. Um, then one of the extra, in terms of um, you know, uh, across the lifespan, um, one of the sessions that I helped organize for this was on middle-aged adults. Um, there's a fair amount of information about young uh, babies and children and even young adults, and a growing amount of information about older adults, but the group in between um, has been largely neglected by comparison, and so the session was trying to address you know, what are the needs of those middle-aged adults and uh, how can we determine, do they have problems that are unique from young and uh, older adults and uh, how can we detect those problems and then the assumption is that if you could identify problems in that age group you could um, uh, apply a treatment or intervention of some kind that would be helpful. Um, right now it's more trying to identify the test that would identify that they have problems compared to uh, other middle-aged adults. And uh, could you share with us uh, some, some experience of yours? Uh, um, uh, this morning you, you uh, spoke about uh, um, a study of uh, age-related changes. Uh, what about this? Uh, yeah, so in, in our particular work we've studied sensory processing and cognitive processing um, uh, in young adults, middle-aged adults, older adults. Um, and one of the interesting findings I think there that, that talks about, um, uh, in, in general people have known for decades that as people age their cognitive function declines. But one of the things that that study argued for and had evidence for was a possible reason that they decline in cognition as they age is that their sensory processing is declining as well. And one of the interesting findings was that if you took out age, statistically, there still was a strong relationship between sensory processing and cognitive processing. So that those that had the best sensory processing had the best cognitive function and those that had the poorest sensory processing had the poorest cognitive function. Um, and so it happens to be that many older adults have poorer sensory processing, and that's why we argue that many of them have poor cognitive processing. Now the implication also is that if you can intervene to try to treat sensory processing, you might be able to either eliminate or delay or stall the development of cognitive problems now that's a lot longer, that, that's a, 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 a far extension of what we know now, but that's one of the possible implications um, and one that we're, we're actually now doing a longitudinal follow-up to that original study to see if in the same group the people who first showed decline in sensory measures are the ones who are first showing cognitive decline. So we need longitudinal data to support that argument and that's what we're in the process of getting. Um, but it ties into work that other people have gathered recently about sensory processing, hearing in particular. Um, Frank Lynn has done several studies now, epidemiological studies, and sees a correlation between hearing loss and cognitive function. Although when you look at the correlation, the strength of the correlation, it's, it's statistically significant but pretty small. The kinds of correlations that we saw were a lot larger and I think the reason that is is it's temporal processing, processing of timing information and it also included multiple senses. So if you have those kinds of problems in hearing and vision and touch, you're more likely to have 
cognitive problem as opposed to if you have problems in just one of those senses. Um, so anyway, lots of possibilities that we're exploring. Um, it'll take follow-up work, uh, especially longitudinal work, to sort that out. So. Thank you, Professor Humes, sure. and enjoy your stay on Lake Como. Oh, thank you.